Okay, in this video, guys, we're gonna talk about average costs. This is a little bit of a digression, uh, but it's gonna be important to understand these, uh, these graphs and understand these average cost concepts for thinking about when firms should enter a market, when they should exit the market. So there are three different types of average costs that we're interested in. Average fixed, average variable, average total. And the definitions of these are pretty straightforward. Since they're averages, that just means we're dividing by the quantity of units. So the average fixed cost, or the AFC, that's just equal to the firm's fixed costs divided by the quantity of units that it's producing. Average variable cost, or AVC, that's equal to the firm's variable cost of production divided by output. Average total cost, or ATC, that is, you, could, you can write that two different ways. You could say it's equal to the firm's total costs divided by its level of output, or equivalently, you could say that average total cost is equal to average fixed cost, fixed cost divided by quantity, plus average variable cost, variable cost divided by quantity. All right. Now, um, I'm going to draw a graph of each of these uh, to the right here and kind of explain a little bit of what's going on. So average fixed cost, notice that the fixed cost is a constant. Okay, it's just a certain dollar figure. And then as you ramp up production, as you divide by a larger and larger quantity, you're dividing that same number by a bigger and bigger number. So average fixed cost is going to start high or start at its highest point, and then it's going to fall as you produce more output. Because let's say that your fixed costs were a million dollars. Well, if you have a million dollars in fixed costs and you produce one unit, your average fixed costs are that million divided by one, which is one million dollars. As soon as you produce two units, you're splitting that million dollars across those two units, so your average fixed cost becomes half a million. If you produce 10 units, then you divide a million by 10 and you get average fixed costs of $100,000 per unit. If you're producing um, you know, a billion units, then a million divided by a billion is one over 1,000, okay? So you're producing uh, at an average fixed cost of less than a penny uh, per unit, well less than a penny per unit. So the average fixed cost curve is gonna look something like this. Okay, and it just keeps getting closer and closer to zero as you produce more units, but it's never gonna reach zero. Average variable cost is, uh, let's see, average variable cost depends on if your marginal cost curve is U-shaped or starts at zero and you know cranks up from there. I'm gonna assume that it's U-shaped though, and let's say that it starts at about the same level. I'm gonna do this one in red. We'll say it starts at about the same level as um, average fixed cost. It is going to be a U-shaped curve. Okay, the reason for that, if the marginal cost curve is U-shaped, is that as those marginal costs fall, they start pulling the average variable cost down. As the marginal costs come back up, they're still pulling average variable cost up until marginal cost crosses over and is equal to average variable cost. And then when marginal cost climbs, it starts pulling the average variable cost up. Okay, So average variable cost is generally going to be U-shaped. And now I realize just now that I'm, I'm reversing this color coding. I'm, I'm drawing average total cost with blue when it was supposed to be average fixed cost, but bear with me on that. The average uh, total cost curve is just the sum of average fixed and average variable. So right here where both of these numbers are pretty high, you just stack the two on top of each other and average total cost would be about up there. Now what's gonna happen? The average uh, fixed cost curve as your at, sorry, the average variable cost curve, as the average fixed costs get closer and closer to zero, this number is getting smaller and smaller. It's getting closer and closer to zero so that your average total costs get closer and closer to being just your average variable cost. So just like average fixed cost gets closer and closer to zero, average uh, total cost 
gets closer and closer to average variable cost. But just like average fixed cost never reaches zero, average total cost never exactly reaches average variable cost. They just keep getting closer and closer together. Okay. Now I did not draw these exactly to scale because freehanding that is not my strong suit, but I just wanted to show you now uh, with some graphs that I, I printed out ahead of time. Okay. Here is the average fixed cost curve. And notice what the average fixed cost curve can tell you. The height of this curve is always your average fixed. So if you pick a particular quantity of units, like five units, and then you draw a line back to the y-axis, you've created this rectangle here. That rectangle, the height of it is the average uh, fixed costs. The length of it is the number of units. So if you multiply that average times the number of units, you're going to be able to calculate what your fixed costs were which in this case is five times 100. That tells you that these fixed costs are $500. And more than that, it doesn't matter which point you pick along this curve, you're always going to end up drawing a rectangle that has a, um, an area of $500. So if we pick this point right here, where we've got 10 units being produced, you'll notice that the average fixed cost is $50 per unit. And so this shorter but longer uh, rectangle also has an area of $500. Where I, whether I'm looking at this or looking at this, Okay, I always am seeing the, uh, the fixed costs of $500, all right? Now, what does that tell you about the relationship between average variable and average total? Well, it's the same idea. If I take, oh, that should be five units and that's 10 units. If I take five units and I look at the distance between my average total cost curve and my average variable cost curve, I could then draw two straight lines back to the y-axis. The distance between those two is the average fixed cost. So that is at five units. Remember, that was um, $100 per unit. And there's five units. So this rectangle here is exactly the same as this rectangle right here. Or if I were to produce at 10 units, okay, that is gonna be $50 separating the average total from the average variable cost. That $50 is the average fixed cost at that level of output. Once again, the area of this rectangle is going to be the same as the area of that rectangle. Okay, so I can find my fixed costs by basically drawing a box in between the average total cost and average variable cost curve and drawing straight lines back to the, uh, to the y-axis. Okay, there's one last thing that I want to say about costs. And this has to do with fixed costs. This is the idea of sunk costs and fixed costs. So what is a sunk cost? A sunk cost is a cost that you cannot get back. It cannot be recouped or alternatively, if you haven't paid it yet, it cannot be avoided. Okay. So a sunk cost, let me just go through a, a simple example. We all know that if you buy a used car, no, sorry, if you buy a new car, as soon as you drive it off the lot, that new car that you purchased becomes a used car and it instantly loses a large percentage of its value, somewhere between 20 and 30%, uh, or maybe even a third of its value, as soon as you drive it off the lot. That, that's instant depreciation, okay? So, when you bought that car, you paid the new price, call that P new. Let's say that you bought the car for 
$30,000. You drive that car off the lot, let's say it loses a third of its value. Now, if you were to turn around and sell that car, you would have to sell it at the used car price, which is a third less, we'll say, whoops, not 10,000, which is $20,000. So as soon as you left, you lost those $10,000. That means that you faced a sunk cost, or you have a sunk cost on that car, that's equal to $10,000. There's no way of recouping those $10,000 by selling this car back, okay? Because you can know, you don't get to sell it at the new price, you have to sell it at the used price. That is a sunk cost, all right? Now, economists will tell you that sunk costs should be ignored when you're making decisions. The reason for that is Sunk costs, there's nothing that you can do that changes a sunk cost, right? And therefore, because nothing you do will change that sunk cost, you shouldn't spend time uh, thinking about the sunk cost when you think about what to do. Because the sunk cost will be the same no matter what you do, okay? So you should always ignore sunk costs when making decisions. People very frequently violate this, uh, this economic logic. Very frequently, we do take sunk costs into account when we are making our decisions. So for example, you've probably walked into a movie theater, paid good money for a movie, and as you started watching it, it turned out that the movie was not as funny as you were expecting it to be or as exciting as you were expecting it to be, and you didn't really enjoy your time. You weren't enjoying your time. But there's a very high probability that even though you didn't like the movie, you didn't leave because you had already paid the money. It's very common for people to say, well, I've already spent the money on the ticket. I don't want to waste the money that I spent on the ticket. So I'm going to stay and finish off the movie anyway. Okay. Well, an economist would tell you that's bad reasoning. That price that you paid on the ticket, that's a sunk cost. You're not going to get that money back by watching the movie. Instead, all you're going to do is you're going to have wasted your money and you will have wasted your time by completing the movie. So you can cut your losses by just walking out of the movie theater right away. Okay. Similar things happen uh, when countries go to war. If the war is not going particularly well, you've spent a lot of money on it. Maybe you've lost a lot of people. You've probably heard the term, the, the phrase before, we can't let our soldiers have died in vain, right? The idea there being, well, if we win the war, then in some way that will, um, that will redeem the, the lives that were lost. An economist would tell you, look, the number of people who've already died, that's a sunk cost. They're not coming back from the dead if you win the war or not. The question is, going forward, do you expect the extra cost in lives lost and the extra cost in treasure expended to be worth whatever you get out of the outcome of the, of the war? Okay. And last, you could use the same um, logic around relationships. If you've been in a relationship for two or three years and it's a pretty sour relationship, it's not doing particularly well, it would be a fallacy to say, well, I've spent, say, three years with this person. I don't want that time to have gone to waste, so I'm going to uh, stick it out with them, right? I'm not going to break up with my, my boyfriend because we've been together for so long. I don't want those years to have been wasted. When economists would tell you, look, if those were bad years that you spent with this person, they were already wasted, okay? You're not going to get those years back by spending another three years or another five years in the same bad relationship, okay? The question you need to ask is, going forward, will you get more out of, um, of will the benefits of being in this relationship exceed the cost of being in this relationship from now to whatever future point you want to, you know, take your cutoff to. So sunk costs ought to be ignored. Frequently they're not, but they should be ignored. Okay. And the last thing to point out is fixed costs are sunk costs. Remember that fixed costs are the cost that you have to pay whether you produce nothing or whether you produce a whole bunch of units. Okay. And so that would be like, um, you know, your, your lease agreement. You have to pay your landlord uh, a certain amount in rent every month, whether or not you make anything, any units, okay? And so since you're gonna have to pay your landlord that rent one way or the other, you shouldn't let that rent payment 
affect your decision of whether to be producing or how much to be producing. All right, that's the last the last point to bring up, and that's something that I'm going to uh, get into a little bit more in the next video on entry and exit into a market.